I recorded that. I think I should have this. This button should be done. For <laughs> I was just gonna say, like, I forgot my tie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's a, a little uh, play between guitar and, and djembe. Here's a little uh, sitar and saxophone. You're able to hear that, right? No. Oh. No. Really? No. No, I could hear the first part, the first one, but not this. Uh, let's see about this one, which is Chinese instruments with bagpipes. Yes. Yeah, that hurts. But now, at first, you could hear it. Now the sound is almost gone. Yeah. What was that? No, just just white noise now. Huh. That was the, the Tycho swing. Yeah, 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 I remember that. Terry, I think it would be nice for you to, to send us the links so we can check all at the same time and I then we can back to the class. Yeah, drop those in the chat. We can't hear. We hear the first note, yeah. and then mm -hmm. the audio cut out. All right. Sorry. But I can't see anything. Sorry, Paul. I think, I think it's due to the, the thing of Zoom only being able to deal with one microphone at a time. So if anyone says anything, as soon as you're showing that, I think it cuts out. I do, th I do think you have like an option to uh, change something in the settings if you're a host, like if you're sharing your screen, then yes. you can you can also share your audio streaming. But I don't know. I mean, I'm just guessing that might have been. We can try maybe muting everybody, you know, being muted, and I'll, then I'll just, I'll just send you some links. I'll actually I'll put them in the chat maybe or. Yeah, dump them in the chat, and then if you happen to troubleshoot it by the end of this, the call, then we'll just listen to them all at the end. Cool. Oh, okay. So Terry Olson, Chief Arts Instigator. Yes. For, for Orange County. Uh, Director of Orange County Arts and Cultural Affairs, is that accurate? Yes. Correct title. <laughs> and also the visionary behind Fusion Fest, now in its third year. Very exciting. And I'm serving as the music curator. Um, Terry, do you want to give us a quick overview of what Fusion Fest is? I'd love to do that. Uh, so Fusion Fest is, is its third year, and it is about... <laughs> diversity that we have here in Central Florida. Over 100 heritages have participated in the two years of Fusion Fest. And a recent study says that in 10 years, uh, we're very likely going to be the most diverse major city in the world, mm. in the world. So uh, because we are this crossroads of the world, uh, the most visited place, one of the most visited places on the planet, uh, we feel it's a really good place for us to show the world that people of different heritages, different ethnicities, different lifestyles, different religions can live together uh, with a basis of love and respect as opposed to fear and hate. And so Fusion Fest has two tracks. One is about heritage. So being proud of whatever heritage, I was just talking today with a Nigerian woman uh, who has the Nigerian Flavors restaurant. Um, and and I didn't know there's 11 Nigerian churches in Orlando. Did you know that? Um, there's a lot of Nigerians and there's three ethnicities in Nigeria. Anyway, I get off track here. Um, so it's honoring those heritages and showing them off. So 
uh, in music, we've had an Urhu player, Chinese, we've had bagpipes, we've had, you know, different heritages. And then it's also about exploring how now we're influencing each other to create our own unique Central Florida identity together. So that's where our fusion contests come in. And we have $1,000 prizes in dance, in music, in fashion, in food. If people can take elements of different uh, regions of the world and make something new and creative and innovative um, out of that. And so uh, our goal tonight is to explore and inspire and um, give you maybe some tools that you didn't have, hopefully, or, or brush them up so that you might enter that contest and um, win $1,000 for a new performance that you would do that incorporates some things from different parts of the world. How's that? Terry, when is the, uh, when is the deadline? The deadline is September 1st. So um, we have a month. And that's the deadline to apply, actually, to put mm -hmm. in your intent to participate. Um, from there, I can't remember. Let's well, let's look at um, websites. This I can share because it's just a website. So for the fusion music contest, yeah, um, September first is the deadline to apply. By October first, you'd be notified that yes, you're in. Um, and then the festival is Thanksgiving weekend. Mm -hmm. And to apply, you just go to fusionfest.org slash music, and then you can go through um, this process of applying. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. So um, I know that Matt already has all this information, as does Terry. Um, but for the rest of you, Sam and Eric and Jeremy, uh, there are three different lanes, uh, well, four different lanes for musicians to participate in Fusion Fest. Uh, the fourth one is the Diversitastic Choir, which if you're interested in participating in that, mm -hmm. uh, I am not the main point of contact there, but you can uh, get information about the choir opportunity uh, from the website. So I would encourage you to do that. And the other three are under my domain. So there are the heritage music performances where we're looking for short performances. Um, uh, generally they've been 10 or 12 minutes long uh, in the past, but uh, we will have some longer um, sort of 20, 25 minute uh, performance slots available as well. Um, and those are never meant to be so those are designed to highlight a specific musical heritage. Um, so for instance, I performed last year with Beatrice and we played uh, some tango music uh, and music that used the, the rhythm from the tango. Um, so the habanera rhythm uh, is, a, is a Cuban rhythm. It started in Cuba, it went back to Europe and then from Europe crossed to Argentina. So we sort of traced some of that musical journey um, and that was the heritage that we were representing, uh, Cuban rhythm. But it could be uh, any musical heritage. Um, the other lanes are our competitions. So the fusion music contest, um, the idea is that you are taking elements of one or more musical uh, cultures and combining them in a new way. So you can submit uh, your intent to participate in this fusion music contest and apply for a heritage music spot, but you would need to, to do both applications. Um, it's mostly the same material. There, there's just a, a few extra questions, a few different questions on the fusion music contest, but what we're looking for is, you know, a, a new an original uh, piece of musical fusion. If that's part of what you do already, um, that's that's okay. It's okay for you, you know, an existing song um, is, is fine. Something that's already in your repertoire that represents that musical fusion, that's fine as well. Um, so that is the, 
uh, contest that is being judged for a thousand dollar cash prize. So um, there is a panel of distinguished judges who are not me, uh, and they represent different musical heritages from around the world. Um, and so they'll be listening to the people who are selected as finalists uh, in that contest and, and deciding who wins that grand prize. Um, and the other contest is the theme song contest, which is kind of what we're going to be talking about today as far as arranging. Um, and that is uh, the Fusion Fest theme song, My Colors. We're looking for new versions of that theme song. And this is a, a cool thing that we're, we're doing every year and hopefully building an identity of the festival through this song and, you know, disseminating this song as a, a cultural meme um, emblematic of, of Central Florida. So um, the, the winner of this contest will get a $150 prize. Um, and it's, you know, just a cool thing that you can do. So it could be anything from a solo um, cover, like with your principal instrument and voice, or it could be a full production. It could be um, electronic music. It could be acoustic music. We're really looking for any um, new arrangement, new version of this song, as many as we can get um, to try and, and make something uh, really special and unique with it. So those are the lanes um, that we're looking to fill with performers this year. Anybody have a question about those so far? Not really. Okay, pretty clear. Because I, fi I figure you're going to expand <laughs> or yeah, expound. So we have composer and educator Jeremy Adams here with us. Um, when we were, Terry and I were talking about who we should bring in to, um, to talk about arranging, I immediately thought of Jeremy because um, he has such an eclectic background in music um, from touring professionally and consistently with a jam band to playing with jazz ensembles to playing, um, didn't you also play an orchestra when you were at UCF? Yeah. They yeah, have and concert or bands, yeah. Orchestral experience, concert band experience, electroacoustic music composition, you know, everything from the avant-garde to, you know, playing at World of Beer. Like, you've got the whole spectrum of uh, musical experience in there. And then also you worked with um, marching bands, right? Like, with uh, yeah. drum lines. Mm -hmm. So all different kinds of experience. I thought it would be just great to have you talk about it and you've done some lectures on arranging for our program at Timucua works with sounds our music education program so I thought it would be cool to to bring Jeremy in and talk about you know some arranging 101 topics and then maybe take some specific questions from you guys okay so Jeremy what you got arranging 101 any any thoughts about arrangements about what makes a successful arrangement, what makes a good arrangement, what are you looking for when, uh, when you choose to arrange something? What do you got? Well, uh, the first, I think probably the most important thing for an arrangement is starting with a good song. And um, fortunately, this song, My Colors, is awesome. I've been listening to it for the last two hours straight. <laughs> um, just trying to get some ideas, just you know, to hear it. Um, Matt, were you singing on that? Or did I misread something? No, I, I, I was not singing. I played uh, the instruments, though. Oh, okay. Oh. And, uh, and I, was, I was actually, I co-wrote the song with those two guys. It's okay. Real well, anime. excellent song. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, yeah, so starting with a good song is obviously one of the most important parts of arranging because, I mean no matter how many different ways you arrange Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, it's going to sound like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star in some level. So if you don't like the song, arranging it's going to be kind of tough. Um, this competition presents kind of a unique aspect in that it's specifically focused on cultural fusion, which is something I've experimented with in the past. Um, growing up as a white kid with no real cultural heritage, I tried to latch <laughs> on to everything that I could. 
And uh, Chris will probably remember when I was an undergrad, I wrote a couple of songs in a Latin American style, and I focused very heavily on Latin American rhythms. Um, and I've moved on from there. My wife and I are recording a uh, Armenian reggae album. So lyrics in Armenian, but music is reggae. And so cultural fusion is something that's always been pretty close to me and uh, close to my heart. All that goes to say, um, you want to be careful when you're looking at other cultures, ones that you weren't brought up in from a young age. It's very easy to do what some composers have done in the past, where they take very surface level things, and it can be sometimes cliche, sometimes a little tongue in cheek, and doesn't always work very well. So I would caution you not to do what um, one composer that comes to mind is Franz Liszt. Uh, when he wrote his Hungarian Rhapsodies, he took the music from Gypsies and said that that was Hungarian music. Uh, Bella Bartok, a little bit later down the road, came along and said he got it wrong and then completely redid Hungarian music as we understand it. Um, or Debussy also kind of lifted from some Japanese music in a, a World Fair that he heard, and that's where we get a lot of pentatonic scales. But... Um, what I would encourage you to do, yeah. I wouldn't mind, though, if people became famous like that for doing something at Fusion Fest. Yeah, that would be great. But um, up, uh, if I could just interject. Please. One line that uh, with all of Fusion Fest that we want to be careful about is the difference between fusion and appropriation. Yes. And uh, really, for us, respect is the key difference. Mm -hmm. So, taking um, a tribal Indian something and just uh, making it your own without respecting what that is about and where it comes from is uh, where you get appropriation. So yeah. It, it's, a, it's a line, and, and I want us to be edgy on that line, but um, I just wanted to put that out there that respect is a key value a fusion fest in all areas and it would it would come into play at this point as well exactly and that was my sentiment as well uh, worded much better <laughs> uh, so that would be my first caution in this competition is try try to be authentic in what you're doing make sure that anything you're using culturally you understand the origins of it and you're paying respect and homage to that culture rather than just borrowing without any real reference to what's going on. Hey, Jeremy, um, one yeah. way, but it, a good way to do that is of getting together with a musician from another culture. Yes. Exactly. If you, um, we, ha I have resources. Like if you're interested in, like I would like to get together with some Chinese musicians, you can let me know and I can help try to facilitate that uh, coming together. Yeah, absolutely. I was just going to say the same thing. You know, it may seem like we have uh, limited attendance here, but I hope that you're thinking about musicians that you know that uh, that already practice this idea or musicians from other cultures that you might want to collaborate with uh, on this project, um, on the fusion contest and on the theme song arranging. I'm just, I'm just a little bit confused. I mean, I like the concept, obviously, but I'm a little bit confused in what format uh, and, and I'm not talking about, um, because I mean, obviously, I mean, as artists right now, we're really struggling with the, with that mainly, you know, because I mean, I have, I, I, I have done things like that in the past with, with different art forms and different musicians from different backgrounds. But now, uh, like, I mean, obviously, you see a lot of that going on because of the limitations of not being able to meet in person. So. If I want to work together, I mean, recently I did a project with a, uh, a dancer from Japan who's actually in France right now, which I haven't met before, which I know for a fact that it would not have happened if this pandemic wouldn't have happened, you know? So, I mean, look at from the bright side, I guess. But but the, the real question is because uh, Terry was telling us that that uh, basically it's in four, what, in four and a half weeks that we need to have the project done but in what format do you see that do you, do you want me to you want us to do a uh, 
um, a score of the arrangement or you want us to do a performance of it or an idea, a concept? Uh, I'm a little bit lost there. You want to take that, Terry? <laughs> no, I want you to take that. <laughs> okay, so um, what we're looking for as far as the fusion contest uh, is a, a work sample that demonstrates the kind of musical fusion that you're going to do. So that doesn't have to be a completed, perfect piece. It could be, if you're collaborating with a musician from Japan, um, just something that shows at least a work sample of that. Uh, and you can include an additional work sample of you just playing, right, for consideration for a performance. As far as the arrangement of the theme song, that's something where we're looking for a recording. Um, so it, I, it would not have to, in my, what I'm, I understand doing a completely crafted arrangement for serious musicians who are like, well, that's not enough time. Like I'd have to drop everything and focus on that. For me, if there is something that's recorded as as a demo that shows promise um, and and sh exhibits, you know, respect for the original song and is taking it in a new direction, um, that's all I'm looking for. It doesn't have to be perfect and and complete. And then hopefully, you know, we it would lead to uh, eventually a a more fleshed out version, but just something that shows promise. Obviously the recording quality is going to be somewhat important. I don't want to hear like, if it's completely indecipherable, it'd be really hard to judge. But I think most people at this point, you know, even with just setting up a smartphone can create something that sounds passable. So in the, how many submissions were there last year, Terry? I think there were, you said there were three submissions for the theme song arrangement contest. I think so. Yeah, so it's not it's not that we're going to have thousands of, uh, you know, professional arrangers uh, doing this. And I think, from my perspective, it's it's just more about um, spreading the song and the message of the song. Um, so it it doesn't have to be a fully scored like you don't need to submit a score with it. It could be something that you listen to it and and just play your version of it or if you are more naturally um, into notating music then you can start with that um, but yeah some, some audio file I'll need to evaluate some kind of an audio file for that and then we'd like to uh, get a, a good recording of it by November anyway by the beginning so we can use it in promoting you can stick it in between acts on stages that kind of thing yeah. So any other thoughts about, um, about arranging, about particularly successful arrangements or about, uh, you know, an, an idea, you said you were just listening to the song for, for two hours and we have the producer of the song right here. I, I think it'd be interesting to hear some dialogue about how that arrangement came about and, um, yeah, so yeah. What, make, what makes a good arrangement and how did this arrangement come about? What, what is successful about the cultural fusion element of the, the song itself? Well, I'll, I can speak to what I heard listening to the song today. Um, the first thing that catches my ear right when the track begins <laughs> is there's this kind of quasi bossa nova groove that starts off. Um, it's moving between what I think was a B minor 7 and an E9 chord. Uh, let's see. Almost similar to Oye Kamoba in a way. Um, obviously very different. <laughs> but uh, So it starts off with that, but then very quickly shifts when the chorus comes in, and we almost move into a more funk heavy kind of harmonic language. Um, and even inside of the chorus, if you listen closely, the background instruments change their accompaniment pattern halfway through from what could be more of a straight ahead funk to kind of a rock groove. Or something along those lines. So even inside of this theme song or this arrangement, 
I personally hear multiple genres already happening and already being fused. Um, if I were to approach it as an arranger, I would look at playing off of some of that and maybe see if I can expand it and add more ideas in. Um, for instance, those two chords in the beginning would be lend themselves really well to maybe a cool jazz setting of it, something along the lines of Miles Davis, for instance. Um, really, you're, the possibilities are kind of limited to what you listen to. So the more music you're influenced by, the more stuff you can throw in there. And Matt, uh, you are the producer, so I'm sure you have your own thoughts on this song. I'm just going off what I've heard. Oh, unmute. <laughs> yeah, here we go. <laughs> I, I'm loving hearing you like uh, going over the song and you know making comments about it. I, I like it. Uh, I have only one one correction. Oh, please. That's actual bossa nova. Oh, it is bossa nova. <laughs> okay, uh, well, my apologies. <laughs> no, but it's okay. Like that. I, I know that bossa nova became something else. Like I, I, don't, I, I love talking about that because. Um, especially here in America, because of the relationship between bossa nova and jazz, between mm -hmm. Don Jobim and Sinatra and so on, uh, there's this thing, it became something else. Like uh, the way you guys look at bossa nova is different than the way we look at it. Yeah. I freaking love I it. Hear that. I freaking love can that. you elaborate on that, Matt? Was that sorry? Can, can you elaborate on that? I think that's so interesting. Yeah. The, the most important point here I think is going to be the kick drum on the drums. Mm. There's a clav for bossa nova and um, and for example the tendency for a, an American drummer is to play bossa nova without the kick because of jazz. You only use it sometimes but a Brazilian drummer would use it all the time and the, the kick is it works like samba actually Okay, samba now it, it, it became kind of crazy the, the whole conversation. But what I'm talking about is the that goes all the way through the whole song. It's supposed to be like that. So uh, in the intro of the song, it's not the drum. The drums are not doing that. But you have a percussion that's, that that follows it, follows the acoustic guitar, and that groove is bossa nova groove. That that's what it is. The only thing we're missing is that kick, but we have the pandero and the shake it is. That's it. Great. Yeah, awesome. I, I use the term quasi because I've learned that especially Brazilian um, people are very sentimental about their music and they have a lot of well, my favorite story from undergrad about this was uh one of the professors I studied with was on a recording session and he threw in a salsa lick over a bossa nova song, a dunka, 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 something like that, and almost got fired oh. immediately for it. Yeah. So I, I, I tried to be careful, but yeah, it's my very first thought hearing it was, okay, cool, bossa nova. Let me just, let me just try not to make a confusion here. I'm talking about the very intro. As yeah. soon as the drums are there, everything changed. Mm-hmm. Like that's not that's not bossa nova anymore. The only thing that sounds like bossa nova is the the guitar. That's all. But like, so just please, I like I would make a big confusion for sure. And I totally get what happened to that guy you just mentioned. Yeah. Oh my god. A friend of mine was a drummer. He almost had the same problem. He's Brazilian, but he was talk he was playing with some Latin, like some Latin music, music, mm -hmm. and they are. I don't know where they're from, but all Latin, okay. So you know what to expect. And then there's some certain rhythms that kind of talk and cross talk to certain Brazilian rhythms. So my friend obviously heard what the guy was asking him to do. And he said, oh, that's this thing. He started playing. You know, the musician was like the, the band's owner. He went. Like he freaked out on stage. It was live. Like, no, 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 no. Uh, you know, <laughs> to undo what the guy did. Yeah, it was messy. 
And fortunately, that's not the spirit of this competition. So you're not <laughs> limited by those um, purist uh, mindsets there. Uh, but uh, let's talk a little bit more about the song. So when it comes to arranging, there's kind of a handful of things you can play with as an arranger. Um, one of the first one that comes to mind for me is the melody. Uh, the melody is, you know, it's what carries a song. Most people remember the melody as they leave. And as you're working on your arrangement, I would encourage you to try and find ways to embellish the melody. Every culture has their own form of embellishments. Um, the Germans back in the 1600s had this whole series of Baroque ornamentation that was very complicated, but also led to a lot of beautiful music. Um, whereas a lot of American pop singers nowadays have very little vocal embellishment, or when they do, they do the Star Spangled Banner thing where they just sing up and down and go crazy for five minutes. Um, there's validity in all genres, I like to think. <laughs> but, um, so I would check it out. If you listen to the theme song, you can hear some vocal embellishment happening towards the end where they're taking the main melody and then the singer is adding a little bit to there. Um, that would adapt very well for pretty much any lead instrument or piano. So there's a lot you can do with just the melody alone. Um, and if you're looking for more creative things to do or more outside of the box things, uh, you could always consider augmentation, diminution, um, making the melody longer, making it shorter, expanding to rhythms. Um, you can even flip it upside down and invert the melody. Uh, just make sure that you're still preserving the original characteristics of the song in some way because, you know, people need to recognize that it's the same song. Uh, you're muted, Chris. I think that uh, just the idea of starting with the rhythm uh, can be an interesting way uh, to, to look at arranging. Most of my arranging work, I've done um, a, a lot of, arrangements of pop songs for orchestra or um, you know taking an existing existing song and more or less focusing on change of instrumentation so obviously that's that's an easy an easy one to do you know look at the, the instruments that are there and just what do you play you know or take distill everything down into what you can do with a guitar or a piano um, but starting with just the rhythmic concept, um, that's a very Paul Simon, uh, Graceland or Rhythm of the Saints, um, two like massively influential world music albums um, that, uh, that that's where those started. Uh, the concepts for those songs all started with um, drumming patterns um, that were worked out and basically an entire rhythmic pattern is mapped out over the whole song similar to how hip hop producers today often like make a beat and then shop it to different MCs. And then once they have the right person, like then they'll write a hook together and then maybe put in an intro and an outro or just fade it out. But kind of starting with that rhythm as a base, I think could be a really interesting way of doing something different with this. It starts with the bossa nova rhythm. So if you just separate yourself completely from the con content of the the existing rhythmic content of the song uh, and the existing instrumentation and just start with a rhythmic uh, a characteristic rhythm like uh, the tango rhythm that I mentioned earlier bam 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 dadim dam dam that's an approach that you could take or you could take uh, a minimalist composer idea and just the same rhythm over and over again. Jeremy did a, a, wrote a piece for me uh, years ago. Da 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 the entire song. The whole time. So taking that kind of an idea um, would also work, but um, just just putting that out there. You know, starting with the rhythmic culture, the culture, the rhythm of the culture that you want to convey. Uh, as the basis of the, of the arrangement. Yeah, I've found that rhythm tends to be one of the most easily definable part of different genres of music. 
Um, even if you just take the cultural aspect out of it, uh, rock music sounds a lot different than jazz. I mean, besides the dumbed down harmonies, rhythm is one of the main aspects of that, in my opinion. Um, and when you add the cultural influence in there as well, um, we talked about the difference between like Cuban rhythms versus Brazilian rhythms, but then also traditional Mexican rhythms like um, not bandito, but I can't remember the exact name of the style. Um, but like mariachi, for instance, they all have very unique rhythms. And what Chris is suggesting would be a great way to start, uh, especially if you can find kind of a stock rhythm that exists, like uh, the tango, like Chris said, dum, ba dum, bum, bum. That's an excellent place to start with a composition or an arrangement because you have a framework which you can base everything else around. Um, Afro pop is another great one, as well as um, even Appalachian music. I don't know how many people are into banjo, but you can take the um, the Bo Diddley beat. Bum, yeah. bum, 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 bum. That's in so many songs. Uh, really versatile. That could be used for some of it. Or um, even a classical Alberti bass. Do 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 do. <laughs> so um, I want to direct the conversation toward Sam Desmond for just a second because I know that you are an arranger yourself. Um, you've done a lot of um, guitar ensemble pieces. Um, what other kinds of arrangements have you done? And you know, what are some thoughts that that you have? You know, as a professional musician and who does arrangements. Whew. Well, to be honest with you, when when uh... I mean, I started the guitar ensemble at Valencia College, uh, what was it, two years ago or a year and a half ago, something about that. Um, and, and to be honest with you, I, I, looking at the, uh, at the format of a guitar ensemble, I, I, it didn't really get me too excited. <laughs> uh, mainly because guitar isn't, first of all, isn't used in a large setting most of the time. I mean, at least acoustic guitar or classical guitar in my situation. Um, and, and, and the, the repertoire that was on the market is, I mean, I don't want to kick somebody here, but it's, it's rather dull. You know, many times it's just like a, um, a, a way of, um, you know, instructing, I don't know, 20 or even more guitarists uh, playing one line, you know, uh, just one note at a time, very simple. Uh, uh, you know, and, and, and they approach it, many composers approach it like uh, approaching writing for a string quartet. You know, you have a main melody, you have a counter melody, you have a bass line, and then based on that, you form some harmonies. But the guitar obviously is way more uh, capable um, than, than just, you know, than just doing that. Plus, I, in, in my opinion, I think what makes an arrangement interesting is that each voice needs to be contributing something and not just filling up gaps you know I, I i almost to the point where i feel i mean not completely but it's going to the direction where every single voice that i'm writing for needs to be entertained as a player but also as when you're listening to it you know because that's one of the main things why i i, I enjoy going to a live concert versus um a recording if you're you know if you're especially with symphonic works you can kind of you know uh almost like like a like a, a photographer uh, looks for for its canvas you can kind of look at a particular instrument or a particular voice and you you filter out the rest and you can explore a whole different world so i think based on that an arrangement that i think is interesting is that each uh, instrument and in, in my situation it was a challenge because I was dealing with all the same instruments you know so very quickly you end up with an, many many times you end up with repertoire where each instrument is getting into the same waters as any of uh, their neighbors and that makes it in my opinion a, a kind of thin you know kind of like okay I've, I've got it I've, I've seen it you know this is how guitar sounds like which it, it really isn't you know so I, I wrote I wrote that arrangement based on a theme by uh, Django Reinhardt, which is a uh, fellow Belgian guy. I'm not gonna say uh, I'm on the same level of playing, but 
anyway, we kind of share some common ground, I guess. So I took a, I took three notes basically, and I wrote the whole arrangement uh, on that. And then so it's it's basically what I did. I started out with one melody, and then I used my uh, education, I guess, or my background as a as a as a as an academic to write some uh, counter melody towards that uh, but I'm using a lot of um, uh, counter motion and a lot of uh, action and reaction versus those two voices and I think it, 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 the arrangement is one thing but it's also the live performance so the idea was doing the live performance the setting that these counter voices are you know really spread out rather than just sitting next to each other because I mean if you're with especially like if you would be with 20 people you wouldn't even notice that those are two different voices. If, I mean, at least if you're not a guitarist, you know, very often it's just like a cluttered voice because it all comes from the same direction, but spreading that out, kind of similar to what we did uh, last week with the uh, recharge, you know? I kind of like that idea because it's very spacing out and the sound comes from a different, uh, different direction which is kind of similar by the way which really bothered me as a as a teenager going to rock concerts uh you go to a rock concert you stand in front of the stage and you hear an acoustic guitar on the same volume level as the electric guitarist which to me is like i don't get that that doesn't make no that makes no sense and the guitarist is over there and the the, the electric guitarist is over there but yet i'm getting the same sound it, it, it i mean imagine if you're if you're closing your eyes you have absolutely no idea where the true source of sound is and i think you know the arrangement is one thing but the performance can make or break the arrangement very often too i mean and, and acoustics and whatnot and all that so basically to go back to the arrangement i did one one uh Wait, I mean, I kind of have a guitar here, so I might as well just. But basically, one voice did this. Used that articulation, which I. I and then another voice used. Uh, like each voice has its own kind of identity, its own typical aspect, which kind of I hoped. Uh, I, I think I hope it helps uh, kind of putting the different voices in the picture. You can easily, because of those typical characters, you can easily pin out, okay, this is this this belongs to this guitar or this voice. And um, and then another person was playing chords, but I, and you know, even though the piece wasn't really that hard, but I always emphasized on uh, adding a lot of articulation and dynamics because not doing that uh especially if you're dealing with an arrangement that is for the same instruments uh like i said it's, it's gonna lose the identity for each voice so i had a rhythm section i had chords um i had a melody i had a counter melody and then uh, within those different instruments i used themes from one instrument from one voice and imitated that into the new typical then uh yeah, for that instrument, like with the typical aspects, I, I, I uh, kind of stole that from from earlier from one theme and then brought it back later, but within the chord or within the counter melody or something like that. Anyway, I can, it's just an attempt, you know. I I, I don't claim that I, I that I uh, that I succeeded in that, um, but to my surprise, actually, uh, I noticed. I mean, if everybody feels. Uh, the need to write for guitar ensemble. I think there's a, a, a serious need for it though, because there's a lot of programs out there that are starting to, you know, with guitar uh, ensembles. And to be honest with you, I looked so hard and I couldn't really find any. And, and then I decided to just post it online. And yeah, I, I, my, my peers are friends all over now. Not, not, uh, not that it matters, but I don't know, it's somehow, Oh. All right, so if we've, we've, we've come up with a couple of good ideas. One, start with a good song. We know that we're already doing that. Um, and then we talked about the idea of using um, 
choosing a particular rhythm uh, that represents a, a, the heritage uh, or heritages that you're fusing in, uh, in your arrangement. So focusing on rhythm, um, we talked about making e each instrument that you add or each part of the arrangement should have its kind of own identity. Um, and rhythm, giving a particular rhythm to each instrument is a really great way of doing that. Making the parts enjoyable for each player, if you're going to have multiple players involved, or if, for yourself, if, if you're going to play all the parts yourself in your arrangement, make sure that everything is enjoyable. If it just feels like fluff, then maybe leave it out and just keep it to the essentials. Um, and we talked about the, and, and what Sam was saying, the limitation of uh, if, you, if you had only one instrument or one type of instrument, well, if you know that instrument very well, you can probably use that to your advantage, you know? Um, you, you're going to know what sounds, you'll know what sounds good uh, on that instrument and how to uh, use it to its fullest effect. We have one other fantastic composer in here that we haven't heard from yet, and that's Eric Branch. Um, <laughs> so I thought that I might as well ask you um, for some thoughts about, um, you know, what makes a good arrangement. Um, and, and maybe you could share, you know, have any ideas come to mind about how you might approach arranging this song, you know, as primarily a, a composer of acoustic music. Well, <laughs> see, my, uh, my experience with um, <clears throat> making arrang uh, arrangements has been in two areas, which are sort of, uh, I won't say diametrically opposed, but very different from each other. On the one hand, when I'm, you know, performing pop music or standards or things like that, you know, I'm basically making, as a pianist, I'm basically making, you know, up arrangements on the fly. And yes, characteristic rhythms are a common part of that. Um, as a composer composer i mean i've uh, you know done arrangements of folk songs and i've you know my approach is not unlike what say britain has done in some of his folk song arrangements where there's a you know there is a characteristic rhythm that is that's used throughout it's really not just characteristic in terms of you know suggesting a particular atmosphere but it's, how do I describe it? it not just a particular uh, location or something, but it's, it's, it's part of the very fabric of the piece. I don't know how to explain it better than No, that. I totally get it. So you're, you're using uh, a characteristic rhythm from a culture um, as- Well, it's not even necessary. Well, in those folk songs, it's not even necessarily from a culture specifically it's you know something um you know uh, something suggested say by the text of the uh, of the song or it's uh you know or the or the subject absolutely so you're finding some uh little element of the song's right. dna extracting that cloning yeah. it and applying it to other elements, uh, whether they're harmonic elements or a melody, or Sam mentioned creating a counter melody. That's a great thing to do in an arrangement. You take what's already there and think, what new melody or can I add to this that's just really going to set it off? And I know from my own experience, like there's very few things more satisfying than that, than coming up with a great counter melody. And you're like, I just made this song better. <laughs> another, another aspect is um, harm, uh, reharmonization, not mm -hmm. necessarily in a jazz context, but but you know interpreting things in a in a different way. I once was working on arrangements of things from the Beggars Opera, the uh, 18th century ballad opera, and uh, the form in which the and lots of people have done arrangements of it, written, yo, uh, etc. And uh, it's one of those things where you just have the melody and you have the figured bass and I would do all kinds of harmonic things that were still using the same bass but completely reinterpreting the harmony 
and which and that is sort of more similar to say jazz reharmonization. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, I think sorry. I kind of ask you something about or or, or Terry. I don't know who can uh, address this, but I mean, you guys are talking about arrangement, but. I mean, it seems that the sky's the limit here, no? I mean, if, I mean, if in the traditional, I guess, what most people understand about arranging is that, uh, you know, people, people rewrite it, but our, uh, f most of it is still recognizable. I mean, because, because Chris, you said, like, you can take, like, one small cell out of it and complete something, you know, maybe in the same style but but a very different uh, uh piece still um i don't know if then arrangement is the correct uh, label for that no well what i what i my reference to extracting some of the dna of a piece was really commenting about what eric was saying um about that particular instance but i would use that idea you know in the sense of you know if you're creating a counter melody or creating some complementary rhythms, you might extract some element of the song that's already there and then build that into a rhythmic pattern that becomes part of the underpinning of a song. Rather than like I identify this these three notes and then compose mm -hmm. a completely new piece, you know, based on that motive in the way that like, you know, Beethoven would take a motive and construct a symphony out of it. Um, so we're coming up on, on about an hour Mm -hmm. That's my daughter cheering uh, in the yes. background. Um, but I want to say thank you to everybody for being here. Thank you, Jeremy, for helping uh, prepare this. Thank you, Terry, for hosting. And thank you, Matt, for writing this amazing song. Um, Sam and Eric, your contributions were great as well. And I hope that you guys and anybody who's watching this, once we post the archive and share it, um, will have some good ideas, um, whether for your own arrangement or if you know an artist who loves to cover songs, like I know one person I'm definitely gonna share this idea with because she does all these solo violin covers of pop songs. I'm like, wanna hear what she would do with this. <laughs> so if you know somebody who's already doing this, uh, kind of you know cover songs or doing arrangements, let's share this contest with them. If you know people who are um, already practicing this concept of musical fusion, I've got somebody in mind there as well that I'm going to send this to. Um, yeah, like bring them into the fold, let them know what we're doing. And um, I, I hope to see lots of exciting submissions soon. And Chris, can I just add, um, Jeremy at the beginning said he didn't have any culture or something like that. And I want to say that with Fusion Fest, we say that everybody has a heritage and it is whatever you say it is. So it might be white bread suburban America, but that, that is your heritage. So we are interested in exploring who you are as an individual and where you come from. There's something that brings you to the present. And now we're saying we're in the present together. How are we merging to make something from our future? So it doesn't matter what your heritage is. We want to, and we might not agree with all the, aspects of it of wanting to take that on for our own heritage but we want to respect it and uh together say how are we making our own central florida identity together so um, again i want to thank you all for being on this and encourage you and you to pass on the information to others and for those who are listening later to um yeah just be inspired to try something and uh i wouldn't be too worried sam about if it gets too wild you might create something that's even better. So um, that's cool. All right, cool. Thanks. Yes, thanks. This was pretty cool. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so thank much. You. All right. Goodbye. Thank you guys. Everybody have a good night. Thanks, Matt.